As he ate his small meal, Adelisar stashed a piece of his cured meat, hoping to win over Myrna's furry companion one way or another, even just to have a little peace of mind. His thoughts had only been mildly productive, choosing to accept that perhaps there is a whole different side of the world that he didn't even know about. Exploring that side fully, however, he had decided wasn't for him. His encounter with Myrna was proving to be enough for now, though he wouldn't say no if an opportunity arose. Satisfied with his assertions, Delisar tossed the scrap of meat to Asha, who narrowed her eyes at him before carefully examining the meat at her feet. Slowly, she licked it, and apparently finding nothing wrong with it, devoured it in one piece. Definitely a familiar, Adelisar thought dryly. Testing the boundaries, he tentatively reached out to the cat, his hand palm side up, hoping that the gesture wouldn't offend Asha. Still wary, Asha's gaze flickered between Adelisar's hand and his face, a look of caution and apprehension in her eyes. Carefully, she sniffed his hand, her paw raised slightly. Asha sneezed and shook her head gently, but did not lash out at Adelisa. Instead, she sighed and laid down, legs tucked underneath her, ready to stand again at a moment's notice. Adelisar considered that a victory and withdrew his hand, laying it carefully in his lap, a hint of a smile tugged at the corner of his lips. When he glanced up at Myrna, he watched her struggle to contain her laughter, she hadn't seemed to notice him looking, so he looked down and grabbed a leaf from the ground, turning it over slowly in his fingers. Examining each vein and every imperfection, he almost didn't catch when Myrna started talking again. Forgive me, Adelisar, but am I the first of my kind you've met in person? Have you met others that you would categorize as unsavory? Imps? Fey? Myrna's voice was low, but curious and gentle. Adelisar paused for only a moment. You're the first witch that I've had this long of an encounter with. The other one I met only in passing before my order drove her off. She wasn't like you. Her eyes glinted with a hunger that I will never understand. A darkness about her that made my stomach churn, black hair snapping around her as the air crackled. She had tormented a neighboring village. As for creatures, I've fought many, killed dozens, and treated thousands of wounds caused by them. Sorrow and a faint glimmer of anger settled onto Adelisar's face, his eyebrows furrowing slightly. He refused to look at Myrna, keeping his gaze fixated on the leaf in his hand. It's all so seemingly simple, yet complex, he thought. The basis of life's design. Myrna felt waves of sorrow and anger radiate from Adelisar. She frowned, fully aware that she had anticipated this answer from him. It upset her, but she couldn't decide if she was angry at humans, elves, and dwarves for their role to play in this divide, or if she was angry at her own kind and the other beings that found themselves walking a path of maliciousness. Power had a way of corrupting even the most sound minds, and though she thought she had ditched those feelings long ago, she found herself insurmountably lonely. There is nothing I can do to change those who will not listen, nor those who truly have evil incorporated into their very being. Unsettled, yet unsatisfied with only feeling this fraction of Adelisar's emotions, she let her carefully maintained walls fall. A weighty tidal wave of emotion overtook her, and it took every ounce of her will to not immediately throw her walls back up, shutting out the stormy sea of emotion she had unleashed upon herself. But she had wanted to feel it, she told herself. She wanted to know what it was like to be on the other side. She almost felt bad for showing Adelisar that there was some integrity in the darkness. He knew both parts now, and that knowledge was tormenting him. Her wall snapped back up, cutting out the majority of the energy radiating from Adelisar. Both relieved to not feel it and disappointed at not being able to fully face what she had wrought, she muttered an apology. I am sorry, Adelisar. The apology caused Adelisar's head to snap up, seeing now that Myrna's head was bowed. He couldn't decipher why she appeared so defeated, nor truly why she was apologizing. For what? For 
showing you something that obviously hurts you so much. She fell silent, still not able to meet Delisar's gaze, chiding herself internally, and for not being strong enough to face it properly. Adelisar wasn't expecting her apology to be aimed towards him, and he involuntarily sucked in a breath. Were his emotions truly that obvious? He admitted that he hadn't done much to hide the expression on his face, knowing that his hood would have obscured some of it. Regardless, he didn't expect an apology from her for it. Myrna, you showed me that some of my previous assertions were incorrect, and that there is at least one witch of moral repute when I was convinced that you were going to be the death of me. Don't be ashamed of that. It gives me much to consider. I worry about those considerations. There are individuals to be feared, and many creatures cannot help but fall victim to their fear, or have been taught maliciousness for so many generations that it is part of their nature. Yes, it is true that there are witches who don't live with intent to harm, and many creatures that are simply misunderstood, and the fear on both sides sparks malice. But there are also those who have darkness in their very blood, who do find pleasure in it. I simply... it... I... It's a confusing thing. I worry about the confliction I have wrought within you. Myrna seemed truly remorseful, and not only did he understand, at least to a degree, but he felt as if he was starting to understand the path she was walking. With a sigh, Adelisar spoke softly. My mother was human. My father an elf. My mother left me on the doorstep of the Haverfall Order of Monks just a few days after I was born and I don't know if my father even knows that I exist. The Order decided to raise me instead of condemning me to a life of pain and torment in an orphanage until I became of age. I knew that I would never find an adoptive family. I have a feeling they also knew that I would take to the skills they taught with a certain level of aptitude thanks to the elven blood I possess. I have known scarcely anything else in my 27 years, often shunned at every turn. I would be remiss in ignoring an opportunity to learn more about others and their perspectives, especially when it is offered to me so freely. Turning her gaze back to the monk, Myrna couldn't mask her shock. How can he be so calm about this? How can he have just sat here with me so willing to try to trust and accept me? I wasn't even using my magic to manipulate him. I, I don't understand him at all. Realizing that she had been staring at him intently while she questioned internally, she figured that she should try to find a way to respond. Well, I... <laughs> Thank you, Adelisar. That was illuminating. I... I am so sorry. Though she stumbled through her words, she was being genuine. Recovering from her stammering, she continued, and I apologize for having to ask this, but how are you so open-minded when all you have faced is hardship and pain? You have seen nothing but the worst from many things humans, elves, and dwarves fear, and yet you sit here with me, and after I tried so thoroughly to scare and threaten you earlier. You're going against everything you were raised to believe just by sitting with me, are you not? Delisar almost started laughing. I am still half-elf, am I not? I was born of a taboo union. I am the product of forbidden love. It is my nature to question and challenge the boundaries we have erected. If I don't do that, then what am I? I cannot fear, nor can I deny myself. So why should I deny anything else just because of what I was told or taught? I will not deny that what the monks taught me still weighs heavily on my mind and influences how I handle situations, but that is because some of it I have seen with my own eyes. As Myrna watched his shoulders slump slightly, she had to resist the urge to reach out with her magic to soothe his emotions. It wouldn't be right, but she wanted to lift the weight of his burdens, if only for a short while. That is quite understandable, and on behalf of my kind, I am sorry for the harm we have caused. I know some of them carry no remorse for the deeds they have done, but sometimes it feels like I carry enough for all of us. I truly wish that the horrors you have witnessed could have been avoided. 
Almost an afterthought, she added in a soft voice, I grow weary of hiding in the shadows sometimes. So do I, Myrna. Though I face much less than you do, people might be disgusted by me, but I doubt I would get an arrow to the back because of what I am. Adelisar almost didn't continue speaking, but appreciating her honesty, he couldn't very well hide this from her. I admire your aspirations, but I'm afraid that I am not strong enough to walk that path with you fully. I'm glad to have met you, and I will not shun opportunities to break barriers and bridge chasms when they are presented to me, but I fear that I do not have the strength to actively seek them out. I hope you understand. A sad smile spread across Myrna's face. I do, Adelisar. I could not ask anything like that of you after all that you have seen. As you cannot face the darkness, I cannot face the light. I speak of lofty goals and dreams, but I hardly have the strength to face it when it might mean death. I imagine we are similar in that regard. A simple nod was all the response she got from Adelisar, and it was all the response needed. There is a mutual understanding between the two. They were two individuals trapped on either side of a divide that neither of them could fully cross. It was bittersweet, taking comfort in each other's company, both knowing it was an anomaly. They fell into silence for a while, each of them wondering what had brought them together and silently thinking whatever forces had influenced this chance meeting. Though weariness tugged at Adelisar, he found himself unable to even consider sleep, not because he didn't feel safe, but merely because he had many thoughts swirling in his mind, and he did not want to waste what he considered to be a once-in-a-lifetime experience. He contemplated not asking any questions of Myrna, but his curiosity got the best of him. What about your parents? What is their fate? Shocked, Myrna struggled to reply for a moment. Nobody had ever asked her about her origins, and the only other being that knew the story was Asha. As she took a deep breath, she heard Adelisar quickly retract his question. It's all right, you don't need to answer. Myrna shook her head slightly. Now that would be hardly fair, my dear man. I got to hear about your parents and your upbringing. It is only fair that you hear about mine. Just prepare yourself. This is going to be a long story. Collecting her thoughts, she started off slowly. My parents were both human. My father was a mill worker, and my mother already had three other children to worry about before I came along. Elena, Darren, and Frederick, in that order. They were all normal. Dark hair, dark eyes. I was the odd one out with hair the color of fire and eyes of silver. Her eyes grew cold. I don't remember much. I was very young when Mother took me out into a forest and left me there with nothing but the clothes I was wearing and a baby blanket with my name embroidered on the border. I cannot remember her face. Only her waves of cascading chestnut hair and the way that she always smelled of apples or freshly baked bread. I was out there for several days before a stray fae found me. I was sickly and on the brink of death my magic being the only thing keeping me warm and alive. This fae took me with her deeper into the forest where her clan resided. They nursed me back to health and raised me, taught me how to use my powers. As I got older, I roamed the forest more and more, often going back to the spot my fae mother told me she found me, or trying to go to the edge of the forest without being noticed. Myrna paused, her breath catching in her throat. She swallowed hard, but the lump she felt didn't go away. Adelisar wanted to tell her, again, that she didn't have to tell him anything, but she seemed intent on continuing, despite it obviously causing her pain. When I was 16, I went back to where I was found, again, as I often did. But I started to panic when I saw a woman there. I thought that maybe I could creep away, she hadn't seen me yet. But the glint of the sunlight on her chestnut hair stopped me in my tracks, and I stood there paralyzed. She eventually saw me, and she gasped, her hand snapping up to cover her mouth. 
Her eyes had started to glisten, and her hand dropped slightly as she said only one thing. My name. She had been too young to be mother, and she answered my questions when she spoke again, saying, Myrna? Is that really you? It's Elena, your sister. Do you remember me? My mind had flooded with images of a much younger Elena, but it was her. I knew it was her. I had approached her slowly, unsure of what to think at first. She hugged me tightly and sobbed, telling me how she thought I was dead for all these years. Despite her best efforts, a single tear slid down Myrna's cheek. Elena told me everything. How she had overheard mother and father talking about how they wished I was normal. About how it would be easier to get rid of me once my abilities started to present themselves, instead of try to hide me. How mother wished that she had drowned me as soon as she saw my silver eyes. Apparently, mother would deflect any questions about me. And over time, my brothers, both young when I disappeared, eventually forgot about me and stopped asking. Elena, however, she... She said that mother was on her deathbed, delirious from fever when she finally told Elena what she had done with me. That's why Elena knew where to look, and knew what forest I was left in. But she didn't expect to find me alive. Myrna's lower lip started to quiver, and she quickly stammered out an apology as she lowered her head as if to hide her face. I... I'm sorry. Please, try not to be alarmed, but it would be easier if I showed you. And... I want to show you. Raising her hands in front of her, the fire started to stir, and in it, an image of a young woman became clear. If I had known you were alive, I would have come sooner, Myrna. I am so sorry. Please, come home with me. A younger version of Myrna appeared in the flames, responding to the young woman. You don't know what you're asking of me. Don't you know what I am? What you are doesn't matter to me. I love you so much and have missed you terribly. Elena, I can't. I'm a witch. You're in danger even talking to me. You know what they'll do to me if they find out, and what they'll do to you. But you're my sister. I can't just leave you here. What happened to you was wrong. It doesn't matter, Elena. I am not meant to reside with humans. No witch is unless she wants to sign her own death warrant. The young Myrna examined her sister carefully, taking in the folds of her loose dress, the glow of her skin, her bright, chocolate-brown eyes. Myrna noticed that something was off, and slowly her expression contorted into one of rage. You... how dare you ask me to come back with you when you were with child? It is bad enough that you would risk your own life, and the lives of Darren and Frederick as well, but to risk your own child... What are you thinking? Sister, please. You have to understand. Understand what? Understand you willing to sentence yourself and your family to death for a sister you know nothing about? For a witch? The young Myrna tossed her head in frustration before snapping her hardened gaze back onto the now meek Elena. You must leave. Immediately. You cannot tell a single soul of what transpired here. If anybody found out, you would be executed immediately. You and your child. The flame image of young Myrna raised her arm, pointing past the image of Elena to what Adelisar presumed would be the edge of the forest in the memory. The wisps of her flame hair whipping about her as the faint sound of wind howling rose from the depths of the flame. Go! But, no buts! I am not your sister any longer. I haven't been your sister since Mother abandoned me here. That's not true. You will always- STOP IT! Just stop. I can't be what you want me to be. The eerie sound of the howling wind intensified as the younger Myrna's eyes started to glow, the words she spoke echoing with power. The sister you knew is dead. I am a child of the Fae. I bring nothing but horror and death to your world, a harbinger of destruction and nothing more. 
You must know the stories as well as any. What makes you think I am any different from my kin? Elena's eyes grew misty, tears of fire falling back down onto the logs burning below. You aren't like that. I know you aren't. You can't be. It's not possible. I trust you, Myrna. Don't. The image of the younger Myrna flourished her arm in front of her, casting what appeared to be a veil of mist between her and Elena. Slowly, the flames returned back to normal, and Myrna's hand fell limply to her side. Adelisar opened his mouth, but Myrna spoke first, her voice trembling. Don't... don't speak. It took her several moments to regain her composure, but when she did, she spoke softly. I did not show you so that you would pity me. I have held this within me for many years, telling only Asha my story, and I wanted to tell you. Perhaps I'm simply selfish, wanting to tell someone I knew would understand. I don't think that's selfish. Sometimes it's nice knowing someone can understand. Did Elena understand and listen to you? Myrna smiled sadly. Yes and no. She didn't have much choice. I expended all of my rage and energy in one rush of magic to produce that mist. It spread for miles to either side, and I took all of my desires for her to stay away and wove it through the magic. The effect was an influence on those who came across the mist. They would find themselves unable to even fathom walking through it. It only lasted for five days, but that was more than enough. Elena came back the next day, and the day after. On the third day, I left well before dawn and retrieved the baby blanket that had been left with me all those years ago. I crossed the mist and put it where Elena and I had stood, then went back to my side and waited. I heard Elena's broken sobs when she picked up the blanket, heard her whisper, goodbye sister, and listened carefully to her retreating footsteps until I couldn't hear her anymore. That was the last I've seen or heard of my sister. She didn't come back the fourth day, and the mist disappeared on the fifth. I spent those last two days mourning the person I could have been, and the family I could have had, if I wasn't born a witch. I've hated myself for breaking her heart, hated that our separation had to be so final, but I did what I had to in order to protect her, and I don't regret that. I returned to my clan for only a short period of time before Asha found me. Together, the two of us left and came here. We have never returned. You haven't ever checked in on Elena? No. I've often wished I could, but I can't risk it. I have heard that in some parts of the world, speculation that you are a witch or that you're related to a witch doesn't bring with it immediate death, but in her village, Fear runs deep, and they wouldn't hesitate to execute her, or my brothers for that matter. How well I can conceal my powers wouldn't even matter. My eyes betray my nature. Myrna smiled wistfully at Adelisar. Such is the fate of those whose physical appearance betrays their deepest secrets. A hint of a smile crept up on Adelisar's face though it was laced with bitterness and sadness aimed at the reasons he, and Myrna, were outcasts. While he could hide under a heavy woolen cowl, Myrna had no way to truly hide who she was. It shouldn't have to be like this. Ha, ah, but it is like this, and there is seldom anything we can do about it. The thoughts in Adelisar's mind were tiring. He was all too aware that there were many people who faced similar fates to them, and that truth was unsettling to him. He hadn't spent much time thinking about it, seeing as in his own personal life he was the only one who faced such burdens. But meeting Myrna had stirred a lurking discontent that he suspected had been there for quite a long time. As he idly fingered the hem of his hood, he couldn't help but notice that his body was making urgent demands for sleep. Noticing his fidgeting, Myrna frowned, 
Perhaps it had been too much to divulge, but she felt so comfortable around him, she could scarcely help herself from telling her story freely. He hadn't ridiculed her, and better yet, he hadn't tried to kill her when they first encountered each other. It was completely different from what she had known, and while the loneliness that she bore still stung, she found herself in a temporary reprieve. It was amusing to her, the fact that it took finding someone who could sympathize to such a degree to soothe some of those feelings. She loved the Fae that raised her, and had come to make many friends among the creatures who also resided in this forest, but they had never quite been able to fill that hole within her. A soft rustling and the crunching of leaves brought Myrna out of her thoughts, and when she realized it was because Adelisar had curled up on his side next to the fire, she found a playful giggle rising and bubbling out of her. His hood had shifted just barely to reveal the side of his face. He looks so innocent like this, a far cry from the brooding tension I saw in him earlier. Unable to do anything but smile, she carefully rose from where she sat and walked over to where he had set his pack, grabbing the plain woolen blanket strapped to the bottom, lying it over him gingerly. She had to resist tucking a piece of stray hair back under his hood, and instead made her way back to her pumpkin, settling down in front of it this time, Asha crawling into her lap. You don't mind if I get some sleep too, do you? Asha shook her head gently. Thank you. Keep watch. Wake me if anything approaches. Asha gave one small, confident meow, and with that, Myrna closed her eyes and drifted to sleep. Adelisar woke just as a few stray beams of light started to stream in through the trees. He hadn't meant to fall asleep like that, but his body had many demands and he couldn't ignore them forever. As he shifted, he realized that his blanket had been draped over him at some point. The thought of Myrna covering him made him smirk, and when he looked at Myrna, he found her sitting in front of her pumpkin, fast asleep, Asha in her lap eyeing him carefully. The fire had since gone out, but that didn't bother Adelisar any. He quietly rustled around in his pack, aware of Asha's intense gaze. Triumphant in his search, Adelisar pulled out another cloth parcel that contained a chunk of bread. He ate it quickly, handing a scrap of the crust to Asha. He then gathered his things, signaled Asha to be quiet, and attempted to leave the camp without making a sound. He didn't want to wake Myrna, and he needed to get to the next village. He had made it scarcely thirty or so paces out of the camp before he heard the rustling of a small animal approach from the distance. Within seconds, Asha appeared beside him, and before he could even ask her what she was doing, he heard Myrna's voice call out to him. Leaving without even saying goodbye? That's quite rude of you, monk! He could just barely see the smirk on her face as she approached. He stopped, waiting for her to catch up. I apologize. I didn't want to disturb you. Myrna waved her hand idly. Perhaps, but I don't mind being disturbed. At least Asha here woke me to alert me of your departure. Adelisar couldn't help but chuckle. <laughs> Next time, I won't be so careless. Realizing what he had just said, knowing well there might not be a next time, he opened his mouth to rectify his statement, but Myrna gently shook her head at him. I should hope not! Her warm smile was contagious, and Adelisar found himself smiling softly back at her. I should be going. Not so fast, mister. I'm coming with you. At least to the edge of the forest, seeing as it would be rude to not accompany my guest through my home. That isn't necessary. I will be having no arguments from you. Wouldn't you rather have me with you if something decided to come out and investigate you anyway? Finding her insistence to be amusing, and unable to deny her logic, Adelisar sighed lightly and gestured to the leaf-cluttered trail in front of them. Shall we? Myrna smiled broadly as she started to walk, Adelisar quickly following. They spent much of the walk in silence, merely enjoying each other's company, with Asha trotting next to them. However, Adelisar couldn't help but notice that the closer they came to the outskirts of the forest, the more Myrna's positivity started to fade. Eventually, when the edge of the trees became clear in the distance, 
Myrna slowly came to a halt, Adelisar stopping next to her. I must leave you here, Adelisar. Myrna smiled softly at the monk, though she couldn't help but wish that she could have spent more than one night with this kindred spirit. Adelisar nodded, feeling somewhat bittersweet, valuing his encounter with the witch, and also being eager to get to his next assignment and spend some time with the neighboring order of monks. It's been a pleasure, Myrna. I could say the same. Thank you for trusting me, for sharing, for listening. Hesitantly, Myrna pulled something out of a small pouch that hung from her right wrist. She brought it up to near eye level, revealing an intricately carved pendant that appeared to be made from polished bone, hanging from a leather cord. She gathered it in her hand and brought it to her lips, whispering to it softly. After a moment, she let the pendant dangle again. I carved this many moons ago, and have carried it ever since, unsure why I created it and its purpose evading me. It was crafted from the bones of an animal that unfortunately met an untimely end. I want you to have it. Myrna held it out to Adelisar, who thoroughly shocked her by slowly and carefully removing his hood, revealing shoulder-length wavy brown hair and glimmering hazel eyes. Taking the removal of his hood as a sign, she carefully slipped the cord over his head, the pendant falling gracefully into place on the middle of his chest. After carefully examining the pendant, the Delisar raised his head and met her gaze. A small piece of hair had come out from behind his ear, and Myrna smiled, finding herself wanting to reach out and tuck that piece of hair back. Instead, she gingerly laid a finger on the pendant. You're the first being from the world of the light that I think I can truly call a friend, and for that I am more than grateful. If you ever find yourself in need, all you need to do is whisper my name to that pendant. I will hear you, and I will find you." A gentle smile spread across Adelisar's face, and he was almost overwhelmed by her gesture. He hadn't expected anything like this, and like he had the night before, he marveled at his good fortune, and wondered in amusement how he had ever managed to befriend a witch, good witch or not. Thank you. With a tiny shake of her head, Myrna replied, it's the least I can do. May your journeys be safe, wherever they take you. As may yours. Goodbye, Myrna. Goodbye. Myrna raised her hand in a gentle wave and watched wistfully as Adelisar brought up his hood and turned away from her, setting out for the edge of the forest. She watched the sunlight slowly envelop his figure until she could no longer see him. She turned away slowly, retreating into the darkness of the forest, knowing that she would never see him or his warm hazel eyes again.